Ready? All right. Good, good morning, everybody. Today is Friday, the 23rd of April. April's almost over. I can't believe it. The weather's been getting really nice. And we were just talking about maybe doing some net walking next month as a business <laughs> after hours. I'm really excited about that. Okay, Al, let's get the meeting started. Okay, everyone, have your coffee. <laughs> Yay. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Al. Uh, I also want to thank Center State Healthcare System, always a very good supporter of the chamber. Today's guest speaker is Jer Jeremy uh, Skillings of You Can Be Found. I love the name of his business. Uh, he's going to show us about SEO and Google Ads do-it-yourself tips. Very good information. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, it says I'm disabled screen sharing. Oh, uh, hold on. I didn't realize. Go ahead. <laughs> there we go. All right. Good morning, everybody. Now that we've gotten the technical part <laughs> figured out, um, it's great to be here. I've been a member of the chamber for I don't even know how long. Um, and I have to say, I, I've been doing this for over 15 years. And there's parts of this presentation that were in my first presentation the first year, because a lot of this stuff is fairly simple. Um, it's just you have to think about it and do it. Um, so we're going to go in through, through some things that if you've seen me before, you may have taken some of these notes before because they still hold true. And just as Google gets smarter and as technology moves forward, there's sort of layers to this. Um, this is a streamlined version of a longer presentation that I for the National Small Business Expo. So there are a couple things that I'm not going to dive into quite as deeply, but if you have questions on anything, you can always hit me up and we can have a conversation after, after the talk today. Um, a lot of these topics, you could do a whole section on themselves. So I'm just kind of touching on things really quickly. So with all that being said, this is your tips and techniques that actually work for the perk. So here we go. Um, so this is your map on your way to small business SEO and PPC success. And today we're going to talk more about SEO, but there, there are a lot of things that hold true for both of them. Um, and one is, is location. So um, you want to you want to sort of target the things that most efficiently um, hit, that your business hits most efficiently, and you want to be very specific as a small business, because the big companies are going to get all those huge huge words like used cars or new cars is a very vague broad term, but you want to be um, close and and more specific, so you have a better chance for ranking for Eaton Town new cars than you are for just new cars things like that. Think of, think of your specific target market and create content for that. And with that, um, also, I'm sorry, with local, local search, the number one ranking factor, which you have no control of, is your location. So if you are in Des Moines, Iowa, you're not going to show up very well for New Jersey searches. Um, but if you're in, and it comes even down to closer. So if you're in Asbury Park and trying to show up for Asbury Park, you have a better chance than showing up for Newark. So things like that you have li little control over, but you can build content around ways to target some of the other places that are a little farther from you. And the content on your site allows you a chance to rank for different things that you want to rank for. So I'm going to go into content siloing and topic proximity. I know that sounds complicated, but I'm going to explain it. And it's going to help you sort of better understand how to, how to structure your website to, to better rank for things. So... In the, the theme of what Jilda brought up earlier of Shakespeare's birthday today, um, one of the most important things in SEO, and it's almost become hack to say it, but it's been the case for 15 years, is content is king. So creating great, unique content about what you offer is the best way to rank. And Google's always looking for good, unique content. So if you happen to have Shakespeare on your staff to write for you, that's great, but most of us do not. Um, but if you, if you have a good writer there that can create specific content for your the different things that you offer, you need that. And I think it's the most common thing that small businesses overlook is providing that great experience for people that are visiting your site. Um, if someone came into you at your work, and then I know these days this doesn't happen as much, but if some people, someone came in and asked you a question about what you offer, you'd, you'd have a great answer for them, a nice thorough answer. But a lot of times we don't put that on our website. And you have to think of your website as people coming to your door and they might have questions about your products and services. 
So the biggest thing to take home, and, and there's a few things I'm going to say, if you have a post-it or something today, um, take notes, is to structure your content in a way that's easy for people to find and easy to answer what people are looking for. Um, we have what's called cornerstone content or your main topic areas. For me here, this is an example from my site. I have sort of big topic areas, SEO, digital ads, local search, but within them, there's a lot of subtopics. And I think we all have this, like for in insurance, you might have homeowners, uh, auto insurance, um, business insurance. There are sort of these grand topics that are subtopics of your overall business. So you need to think through what are maybe three to six core topics that you offer and, and create your, it's a big phrase, information architecture, but create your, your website so it's these big, big topic areas and then drop downs within that. And then you wanna support that content with all these things that people ask. So you may have a, a general explanation of one of your broad services, but then what are people gonna ask you? You know what people ask, write content for that. In SEO, you wanna have a page for every concept you might wanna rank for. So for example, with a dentist, people might wanna know how much do implants cost? You can have a page that explains pricing and you don't have to list. I know many of our services, we don't have a very specific price. Um, it depends is often the answer. And in, in SEO, it depends is the most common answer. Um, but you can explain why it depends. So people understand that coming to you. So you, you explain, well, if you choose this, it costs this. If you choose this, it costs this. And it can vary depending on your teeth and, and that kind of thing or whatever service you're offering. But make sure that content is there because you're removing hurdles of people hiring you. So the more information you have, the better. The most frustrating user experience you can have is going to a website and just not having the information that, that you're seeking. So the more information you can provide, the better, but make sure it's unique and it answers your question, people's questions. And more importantly, and this is another thing a lot of people forget about with their website, with SEO and, and with pay-per-click, often the page they land on, a deeper page of your site is the first interaction they're gonna have with your website. A lot of people think, oh, I, I cover that in my about page or I cover that on my homepage, but often people never see those pages. They wanna land on that page that they've found and they wanna see their answers right there. They don't wanna to have to go fishing around to find that you've got 15 years in business or, or whatever it might be. So on each of those service landing pages, explain to them your process and, and why they should choose you for that particular thing and, uh, and get that, that information out there to, re again, remove those hurdles. Um, another key part of this is when you're creating that cornerstone content and sub content, make sure you link back to the core page. So with SEO, I have all these subtopics. Link building is a big part of SEO, site redesigns. When I write the subtopic pages, you always want an easy link back to the main page so people can get there easily for that same reason. Sometimes that's the first page people land on. And once you've answered that question, they're like, okay, I'm ready to buy. I want to understand what the, the larger topic is. And, and then it's easier to get back. We often put hurdles in front of our customers that we don't realize we're doing. Just have a friend or somebody that's not so far into it that, that, that's, that they're biased looking at the site, look at your site and ask them, is it easy to hire me? Do I answer, my, answer your questions? Um, getting back, so, and this touches a little bit on what I was just saying, hire you proximity. So make it extremely easy for people to hire you. Another huge thing I run into with small business owners and just dealt with this this week is um, making sure if you want a phone call, make sure that there's a button on every page that allows people to call you. And in, in these days of mobile, uh, most people are on, it's more than half of visits on websites are mobile now. Your phone number, if you want people to call you, should be click to call. And it's a very basic thing, but you'd be surprised how many websites don't have that yet. Um, again, that's a hurdle you're putting in front of someone and keeping them from calling. And these days, people just go back and go to the next one because of something as simple as that. If you want people to fill out a form to, to make a, an appointment, don't make them go find your contact page. Put that button right on every page so that they can fill out a form and, and, and hire you. Um, again, remember to make sure it is easy to hire you. People have very short attention spans. If they don't see the way to do it right away, they're gonna go back and they're gonna find the next, the next page that will do it. Um, next piece, of, uh, piece for you to write down is your Google My Business or GMB, you might people call this, and it's become huge. So Google My Business is the representation Google has of your business online. And in a lot of ways, in, in Google's mind, they'd rather people never even leave Google. So part of this is Google just trying to keep people on Google rather than going to your website. 
for you, who cares? As long as they hire you, it doesn't matter if they went to your website or, or called you from your Google My Business. But you want to definitely do your best to make sure your Google My Business is optimized. And if you don't have a Google My Business page for your business, you should set one up immediately. Um, the, the quick way to do it is go to business.google.com and they'll walk you through the process. Um, if your business is already there, it'll find it for you because it'll ask you to put your address and name in there and it'll say, oh, wait, is, is this your business? And then you claim it. If you haven't claimed your business, do it. Um, once you claim it, and again, this is one of those areas where we could spend an hour just on Google My Business. Um, and I just actually did that for SCORE a month or so ago. Um, but get in there, there's all sorts of information and Google is, is putting a lot of resources into making people use Google My Business more and more. So they're adding more and more um, features to Google My Business. And if you, if you look, I sort of have this set up so that everybody's faces are over, uh, over the thing in the lower right corner. But in the lower right corner, there is the back end of a Google My Business page. And it's all these different things that you can do. And Google will allow people to text you at your business. They'll, they'll allow you to put menus up, depending on what your, your industry is. They offer all types of things. You answer reviews in here. Um, you add as much information as you possibly can. It'll allow you to list your products and services. All of that and I'm surprised I haven't said this yet, but the phrase I always say is feed the Google beast. Give Google as much information about your business as you possibly can um, so that they can, they can understand what your business is about as an entity and associate you and your business with certain search phrases. So go home on whatever uh, notebook, and I realize this ages me, but um, on whatever post-it or notebook you have, or if you're doing electronic notes, I still take real hand notes. One of the things you should do today is make sure you've claimed your Google My Business page. Make sure it's accurate. It has the right name, address, phone. I've actually sat down with clients where they had the wrong phone number on their Google My Business, and they didn't know, and it had been that way forever. Um, so make sure all of that is accurate. Um, on top of that, I would say Google your business name and address and everything that shows up, not just Google My Business, but you're going to show up in Yelp and you're going to show up in other places. Make sure all that business, all that information is accurate as well. Um, but Again, feed the Google beast, give as much information as you can um, and, and make sure that you're, uh, that you're utilizing Google My Business the best way that you can. So back to, to Shakespeare. So one of the big questions I have from people is what do I write about? And I, I touched on this a little bit earlier about information architecture and writing pages for every concept that you wanna rank for. One of the biggest changes I would say since I started doing this in 2006 is keywords aren't necessarily what they used to be. It, a lot of people understand keywords as a specific exact phrase. And, and we probably all remember 10 years ago, every website that wanted to rank for something would repeat that phrase 55 times on the page. And you'd be like, clearly they're trying to rank for this phrase. Google has gotten smarter about that kind of thing. And they know what other words should be around search phrases. And they look for different phrases that should be supporting information. It's just gotten a lot more complicated. So I always tell people to try to rank by concept and write pages supporting that core uh, cornerstone content we talked about before about that concept. So um, delivery method, these are all different types of things that you can write for. Delivery method um, has changed a lot in the past year for a lot of different things, whether people do virtual or curbside, um, whether you offer free shipping, things like that. Those are important things that people look for. And, and if you offer things that differentiate you, you should write about that and have, have content about it. Um, customer types. A lot of times there are different types of needs for your specific service you're offering. Um, Steve does just about everything, fixing people up in their houses or things are broken or things in, in the yard that are broken. There are all sorts of reasons you might need like Steve or you might need Jilda. Um, think about those different types of people and, and speak to them and write content for them because they're all different types of users of that particular service. You're a solution to somebody's problem more than just offering a service. So think about that. Um, geography, we talked about this right off the very top. Um, target specific locations with you. If, you're wanna, if you wanna target a specific area of Monmouth County, write content about how you better service that. Why, why do you, you uniquely, that's a tough one, you uniquely serve Monmouth County better than some of your competitors and, and write to that. So those are all Great ideas for content. Um, you can write blog posts about this stuff. It's, it's, you don't have to necessarily create it as part of your core website, but you write a blog post and then link back to your core service with this stuff. Another great free way to come up with ideas for writing is people also ask. So 
that they call it PAA or people also ask, if you start to Google something, you'll see Google sort of automatically fill in the rest of the sentence. And a lot of times those are questions about your service. So, so start typing in um, questions about your service and you'll see things that are asked regularly about it. And you can write content that answers those questions. Um, the more, again, the more hurdles you remove and the, the better chance you're gonna have people actually hiring you. They wanna be comfortable with hiring you and not think you're, a, you're in the basement in the Ukraine somewhere, <laughs> which some websites are. Um, again, to specific, and this is just an example. I, I did a presentation talking about specific and content and targets a year ago, and I did a page on Zoom SEO training right when this all started. And I went right to the top. I was number one in Google for Zoom SEO training um, because that's a very specific type of delivery of, of a service. Um, I haven't really done anything with that page since then. I've done a lot of Zoom SEO training. I haven't tried to strengthen it or refresh it or anything since then. But even today, because I built in the custom part of it, I was number one for custom SEO Zoom training as of a week or so ago. So without strengthening the page or anything like that, think of these very specific things that you offer, because especially as a small business, sometimes this is your way in the door. You can start showing up for, for very specific things like that, and it helps build up your strength. And if you show up for a lot of very specific things, often that's just as good as showing up for one big thing that's a lot harder to rank for. Um, next, and this is, a, this is where we just dip into pay-per-click just a little bit. So if anybody's out there doing pay-per-click and pay-per-click is basically when you're paying for a click on, on search. So you see the ad show up in the search result um, and you can, you can set up pay-per-click and it can be very effective for you, but you just have to be very careful because the defaults that Google set up are basically meant to take as much money from you as they possibly can. Um, so you wanna be aware of that. And one of the things that happens with, with pay-per-click and it, it's tough, to, it's tough to get into pay-per-click without going too far into the weeds, but I'm gonna to try to just touch on this a little bit. So when you set up a Google ads campaign, best practice for a small business is um, your campaign has a budget and a geographic target. So if you're a local business and you're serving Monmouth County, you can say, hey, I wanna spend $10 a day and set up Monmouth County. Then the next level down, you create what's called ad groups. And ad groups, much like we were talking with SEO, are set up to match a concept. So when you are setting up a Google paid campaign, you wanna have ad groups for each concept. Someone searching for, to use my example before, uh, dental implants wants to see an ad that speaks to dental implants and then they wanna land on someone's page that talks about how they provide dental implants. They don't wanna just show up on some random page that has nothing to do with dental implants. And that's another thing that a lot of small businesses forget to do is they just send people to their homepage and then the person lands there and they don't see what they're looking for and they leave and you've wasted that money. So with your ad groups, create, a, create an ad group for every concept you want to show up for um, and then create an ad that speaks to that specific con concept and then send them to a landing page on your site that, that answers that question. And the most important thing is be careful because the default setup is broad match. So, um, when you set up a Google ads campaign, it's going to ask for your keywords. So if you, and in this one, they use the, the example lawn aeration prices for broad match. But when you use broad match, which Google doesn't tell you, it's just a default that gives Google the license to match your ad up to anything that they deem even remotely relevant to, to that keyword. So it's very, it can lead to a lot of wasted money. I, I've, sat with clients that had, we looked at their previous six months of ad spend and 90% of what they had spent on was keywords they had wanted, they had no desire to advertise for because they set up broad match. Giant corporations with money to burn can use broad match, but small businesses cannot. It's, it's a big waste of money. So what we tend to move people to is phrase or exact match. Um, exact match, even though it's, a, it's called exact match, isn't exact match, but it's as close to it as you're gonna get. Uh, a year ago, Google changed the, the definition of exact match to mean um, what you type in or close variance. So they're still even allowing themselves to have you show up for, for some things you didn't say, but it's better, it's the best you can do right now with Google Ads. So I, I stress to people to use exact and phrase match. Um, phrase is if you have a few words in a sentence kind of thing where you can show up. So the example there is lawn mowing service near me is a good phrase match and it, and it at least reduces what Google can throw you out there for, for sort of garbage stuff that comes in. And last but not least on Google paid. And again, I'm happy to dig deeper into this if people are looking to set up Google, Google 
paid campaigns is now more than ever, negative keywords are important. Another thing that Google has done recently, they've, they've done a couple of huge things in the last year. One, they changed exact match, like I just said. Number two, they used to have a thing called uh, broad modifier match, which was great and I use it all the time. And it meant you could force a word to be in the search, but it didn't matter what order it was in. Um, and they got rid of that because it was too efficient. <laughs> um, and then the third thing is they've actually started to not show you some of the keywords you've paid for to show up for. So sometimes it'll just say not available for, for keywords that you've paid for. And now you're not even seeing what you showed up for that failed or succeeded um, for making your decisions. So with that, it makes negative keywords more important. Um, a negative keyword is basically sort of the opposite of all of this. If you put a word in that's a negative, it means if this word is in the phrase that someone searched for, I do not want to show up my ad for it. So really common obvious ones are free, cheap, jobs. Those things always show up associated with keywords. Um, but if you put in um, the example here is running shoes and, and the phrase running shoes shows up in someone's search, then it's going to make that not trigger your ad. So that's, a, that's the best way is keep adding negative keywords as you see garbage come in with your account. If you need help with any of this, of course, I'm here to help. I know it gets complicated, but this is a really crucial thing. I've seen so many small businesses waste so much money um, because Google had them. I don't want to say don't listen to Google, but don't listen to Google. It's like asking, uh, um, we saw the great presentation on car sales last week. Um, it's like asking the Toyota guy what brand of car you should buy. Um, obviously, he's gonna, and I have a Toyota, but obviously he's going to say Toyota. It's like you're letting you're letting him decide your your sale for you. Um, be careful with letting Google decide how you're going to pay them. Um, next on the on the SEO agenda is links for you, and this is one of those things. The slide has changed over the years, but for 15 years, this has been the number one ranking factor in Google. So it's very important. Um, the way Google separated themselves as a search engine and became so popular is they found a way to rank results other than, I don't know if people remember I'm aging myself in the nineties, it was basically a lot of lists. Um, search engines were just big category lists of things and you go in alphabetical, it was just like the phone book. Um, and Google differentiated themselves by giving value to pages based on different things. But one of the big things was links. So Google views a link to your website as an endorsement of your website or of that particular page. Now, over the years, it's gotten very specific. Now it's more down to a specific page than the website as a whole. Um, and they're basically like, we're here to network. They're kind of like virtual referrals. If a, if a website is willing to send its visitors to your website, it's kind of like endorsing you and giving you more authority. And Google says, oh, look at all these people that say this is a valuable page. So. Another thing, post it. I've said this for 15 years. Go home, think about all of your offline relationships and how to turn them into a link. If it's possible, um, the Chamber is a, I, is a huge, huge, uh, great linking opportunity for local businesses. Every link tells a story to Google. And being a member of your local Chamber and having your, your profile on a Chamber website and the link to your website is telling Google you are relevant and active in that community that that Chamber represents. So those are huge. Any industry associations you're a part of, get a link from that. Those all tell Google a little story about your business. One of the hardest things to do in SEO is get links. It's all relationships. And one of the things I do for clients is I've been doing it for 15 years. So I have a lot of relationships at more national levels, but these local links are really, really helpful when you're trying to rank for local searches. So um, these are just an overview of different things you can do. I said community involvement, you support local charities, um, local business groups like, like chambers, news mentions, um, blogs, um, sites that uh, do blog posts about a specific type of product and use yours as an example. All of that can help as long as it's legit. Everything that Google values, an entire industry will pop up to cheat at it. So you just want to make sure it's a, a legitimate relationship and not, um, they call them link farms. Sometimes people on Fiverr or whatever will offer you a thousand links for $10 and it's, it's a bunch of garbage stuff that can get you in trouble. So just one, one real link is better than a thousand garbage links. So um, just worry about getting those legitimate links. Um, this is all about ranking factors. So, and don't worry, I don't mean to scare you with all this and we're not going to dive into ranking factors as much today, but basically I get the question all the, all the time is, blank a ranking factor. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of ranking factors and everything matters to some degree. Um, 
the important part is, and where I come as a value, is understanding which things actually move the dial for you. So if you have whatever it might be, $200 to spend on SEO, what, are, what is the best way to spend that $200 to move you in the rankings? Because so many different things do matter. Links matter, your page speed, all of that stuff matters. Um, so don't, don't get too uh, blindsided about all these things because anyone can come to you and say stuff is a ranking factor, but it's like how, how much of a ranking factor is it? And, and is it worth your time and, and effort to, to make things perfect if it's not gonna help you get more customers? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do with this. And this is a deeper dive into uh, local search ranking factors. And I, I'm not gonna dive into this quite as much, but I'll just really quick, quickly go over what this means at a very, very high level. Um, the local packer finder ranking factor factors means those those map pins that pop up. So if you do um, a search for pizza in Asbury Park or whatever it is, you, we've all seen it. The little map pops up with three map pins and you can look for more if you want. So that's what the local pack is called in, in the search world. Now, localized organic ranking is the other links that come under it or over it or around the map that are on that first page. So this is just sort of the, the difference and, and each one pieces of these pies these pie pieces are making me hungry. Um, but these pieces of the pie all have sub pieces to it. Like GMB, I told you before, is Google My Business, but that's all of the stuff associated with Google My Business. So it's, it's the information on there. Um, it's the page you link to. It's that type of thing. Reviews, we're about to get into those. Those are really important. Um, linking to a page on your site, if you, if you link your Google My Business to, uh, to use a example earlier to a page about Toyotas on your own website, you're going to do better for Toyota searches. So the page that you link to on your own website, that content Google associates with your Google My Business. So think about that um, with whatever you're linking to. A lot of people just link to their homepage and it sort of touches on a lot of different topics. But if it's not mentioned on that page, whatever you're trying to rank for, it's going to decrease your, your, your chances. Um, links, we just talked about behavioral stuff. Um, if you've if you've gone to a page a bunch of times and then you always leave and don't do anything, Google notices that. Google sees everything, creepy, scary, but true. Um, and they're gonna take that into account and not show that particular listing anymore. Everybody's rankings are a little bit different. It's all personalized these days. So ranking reports in themselves are kind of useless because we all see different things based on where we are in our, our search history. Um, the other thing that I didn't explain here, citations, that's um, something that, 10 years ago was really important and now is a lot less important. And a citation is basically a mention of your business's name, address, and phone. We used to call them naps um, on the internet and just making sure they're consistent and accurate. And you want that anyway, because you want, you want accurate information out there about your business. So people actually call the right number or go to the right place. Um, so that was a really, really high level view of what all those things are, but I wanted you to be able to see that. And again, um, this presentation is available on my website and I'll give you the link here at the end. So you don't have to write all this stuff down. But I wanna get into reviews really quick because I know we all have to get yeah. on Jeremy, to our, can yeah. Can, can you just wrap it up? Because we have 28 yep. people to do introductions and maybe yep. this is worthy of a lunch and learn. I, I was thinking okay. that. Sure, <laughs> sure. Information and the lunch and learn would give you more time. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, so, the, and then I think this was my second to last slide anyway. So we're, we're um, but I'll do reviews really quick. Just ask everybody for reviews. Um, this goes into the weeds on it a little bit, but do not review gate. Don't just ask the people you think are gonna give you a five star. The secret is to do a great job, which we all do, and just ask everybody for reviews. It's okay to get a negative review every once in a while, as long as you respond to it appropriately and keep asking and, and bearing it with positive reviews. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, you can visit my website. There's, there's a lot of talk about that there. Um, ask for detailed reviews. Um, but always be asking for reviews. Really, really important. That's another thing to take home today. Um, this is a little bit more detail about um, reviews. Google is looking for the words in your reviews to help you rank for things. Really quick, the need for speed. Um, there's a big Google update coming out. It was going to come out in May, but they just announced this week that it's been delayed to June. It's all about speed. Um, just make sure your website, you know if your website is loading really slow, just look into it. Um, there's a tool called gtmetrics.com. Throw your website in there and see what, how it scores. And if you need better speed, you might want to look into that. Um, and remember, I'm your resource. Uh, my slide deck is available at youcanbefound.com slash presentations. Is it? 
I can't say presentation or presentations, presentations. Um, you can get my digital business card by texting YCBF to the number there below 732-444-8885. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. I know it's a lot of information, so sorry to try to jam it in in a little amount of time. <laughs> it was great, Jeremy. All right, so um, I just one or two questions real quick before we go around the room. Does anybody have any questions for Jeremy? Anybody? Look at the room. Quick comment. Uh, I've done one-on-ones with Jeremy and uh, you get even more of a, uh, a fire hose of information. So uh, uh, by all means, schedule with Jeremy. Thanks, right. Jim. He's actually a nice guy too. It's pleasant to talk to. <laughs> we're, we're due for a boardwalk chat too. There's that. There's a porch <laughs> with uh, beer and all that. That's right. All the Ooh, above. beer. <laughs> and Popeye. <laughs> and Popeye. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start the introductions. All right, well, thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a lot of great information. Thank I took you. a lot of notes. And I know he kept talking about content and writing and you know uh, anybody who struggles with that, Joanne, raise your hand. <laughs> Joanne Colella, <laughs> awesome writer. I kept thinking about you through the whole presentation, Joanne. I just wanted to make, make that. When Shakespeare's not available, go to Joanne. Go to Joanne. <laughs> awesome. You're stealing my line. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I can repeat it. It's okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy.